conqueror. text this morning is from Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27, and I've entitled the message, The Power of the Benediction. The Power of the Benediction. Let us read together the holy word of Almighty God. And Moses, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. The power of the benediction. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, when most of you hear the benediction, you know the blessing at the end of corporate worship service? It is generally not a profound moment for us. It's not an inspiring moment. You're often doing what? Grabbing your purse, turning off your tablet computer, or putting away your Bible during the benediction. You see it as a signal that we are about to leave for our homes. My prayer is that all of this will change by the end of this sermon. Are y'all still with me? Okay. I've attempted in many corporate worship services to get the attention and involvement of worshipers in the benediction by inviting them to raise their hands with me while I repeat the benediction. There are several benedictions all across the scripture. In this sermon, we will examine what exactly is going on with the benediction and why it is important. All right? So that after today, when you hear the benediction, you will have a whole different attitude. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Beloved, the benediction, the blessing, that's what it is, speaks to the meaning of our entire lives. If we understand the benediction, when it is said to us, the entirety of our lives should flash before our eyes. A benediction is a blessing. Let us look at what a blessing is. We shall examine its indispensable nature, its incarnational nature, and its identifying nature. Are you all with me? Its indispensable nature, its incarnational nature and its identifying nature. The blessing is serious. It's a profound thing. This passage is very famous. Everybody, if you are around church, you have heard this blessing before. It's called the Aaronic blessing, the blessing of Aaron. And this was said at the end of every tabernacle service in ancient Israel. When the worship service of Israel was all over at the tabernacle, this passage was the benediction. That was how the worship services ended back then. Let's examine it. Number one, the indispensable nature of God's blessing. Look at verse 24. The Lord bless you and keep you. Are you all with me? Come on, are you with me? The Lord bless you and keep you. Now, what is the blessing? What are we talking about? When God created the world, six times in Genesis chapter 1, after he created light and the animals and the other things, he said, and God saw that it was what? It was good. That word benediction is Latin to refer to good word. Benediction is what? Good word. Benny refers to good. Diction refers to word. Hmm? Good word. It says six times. And the Lord God saw that it was good. In fact, twice he says that he saw that it was good and he blessed it. Mm. Very good. And he blessed it. Now, when he looked at uh, what he had created and saw that it was good, he was actually blessing it. By saying that, he was giving a benediction when he looked at something and saw that it was good. What was God doing when he did that? We do not think God made something and then stood back and said, well, what do you know? That's good. No, 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 no. no. That's, not, not, that's how we would do it. Huh? We would say it almost like this. You know what? I think I, I did a pretty good job, if, if I may say so myself. Come on, does that sound like us? Now, if you are omniscient uh, and omnipotent, which is exactly what God is, you do not need to figure out whether or not you did good. 
God is the essence of what is good, and he defines what is good. He knows what's good. He's the one who makes all things that are good. He is omnipotent and omniscient. So if he says something good, nobody can challenge that. If he says something is bad, nobody can challenge that. He is God. Now, what it means then, when God made something and saw that it was good, is that he was enjoying it. When he says it's good, he was what? He was enjoying it. Mm. He was delighting in it. So first of all, the benediction means that one delights in something. Are you following me? One delights in something. But this is not the complete picture. The other place we can go into, uh, into the Bible to get us an idea behind this idea of the blessing or the benediction is to look at how fathers in the Bible bless their children at the end of their lives. How did fathers bless their children at the end of their lives? It was typical in ancient Israel that when a man was about to die, the father in a family, he would gather his children around and would bless them by pronouncing a benediction over them. We will see this in a number of places across the scripture. For example, in the, at the end of Genesis, Jacob blesses his children. What exactly does that mean? On the one hand, when the father would bless his child, He'd be wishing them, he'd be wishing his child well, or his children well. He would say, I long for your good, I long for your prosperity. May you be like this and may you be like that. He was wishing you well. So, on the one hand, with a blessing, a father is delighting in the child, and he is longing for his or her prosperity and good, but that's not all he does. The blessing of a father was objective as well as subjective. It was practical as well as emotional because the father does not just wish good for the child. He actually divides up his property and bestows his property on the child in order to achieve that good. Come on, man. This is what a will is about. Where you're not only just wishing your children well, but you're trying to set them up so that they can achieve what you wish for them. Amen? Okay. So he actually commits his wealth and his estate to the child in order to achieve that good. That is what it means to bless. It is now after learning this that we begin to realize what it means for God to say to any human being, I bless you. Mm. For God to say, I bless you, is to say, I delight in you. Wow. Not only do I delight in you and wish you well, I am committed with all my power to achieve your good. I'm going to make you an heir. An heir of God. <laughs> what is A joint heir with Christ. In other words, I'm not just going to wish you well. I'm going to set you up. Oh, <laughs> hallelujah. I don't just wish you a good life. I'm going to help you achieve that good life. I am going to be expensively present with you all your life. Oh, you didn't hear me. Uh, somebody heard that. Huh? He said, I'm going to be what? Expensively present with you all your life. All my resources are at your disposal. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's what good fathers do. Bless the children and set them up. Come on, man. They try their best. They do their best. That is the reason it says the Lord bless you and keep you. Why? Our God does not just wish us well. He takes the initiative to achieve it. He does not just wish the good. He organizes his affairs to achieve it. Yes. How important is the blessing of God to us? Perhaps our best case study of, in the Bible of, is, is the story of Jacob. You remember Jacob? Yes. Jacob and Esau were twins. You know the story? And they were born to who? Isaac and Rebekah. Come on, man. Hmm? Now, Esau was the first one out. Huh? Obviously, the first one out is technically the older. Even though it is obvious that they were pretty much the same age since they were virtually born at the same moment. But the first one out is the first one out. Esau was the first one out, and because he was the first one out, in ancient times, the law of primogeniture Mm, the law of 
primogeniture was that the oldest son got the macro blessing. Come on now. The oldest son got the greater part of the father's estate, became the head of the clan, got the most of the wealth. The oldest son, therefore, got the major blessing from the father at the end of the father's life. So Esau was, supp was supposed to be set for life. The only problem was that God had sent a prophecy. Oh, my. God had sent a prophecy, an oracle, to, to Isaac that this tradition, this convention, was being suspended in this particular case. God is God and he does as he pleases. He doesn't have to follow any tradition. Yeah. Y'all realize how this works, okay? Yeah. He, he, this was a sovereign decision. The owner of this state could follow tradition or break with tradition. <laughs> he does as he pleases with that which is his. God had said in effect, look, even though Esau will come out first, I want you to know that Jacob is the one that I'm going to work with. Jacob is the one to whom I'm going to bring salvation to the world. Therefore, I want you to bless Jacob. I want you to make Jacob the head of the clan. I want you to give Jacob the major blessing and the birthright. Of course, Isaac did not agree with God's decree. <laughs> His heart was set on Esau. He loved and doted on Esau. And he ignored the prophecy. He ignored Jacob. Jacob grew up angry. Jacob grew up needy, like a child whose father was Jewish his affection and his blessing. But when Isaac was very old and was practically blind, and the time came for him to be giving the blessing to Esau, Jacob, with the help of his mother, Rebekah, dressed up as Esau, went into his father and posed as Esau, and Isaac gave Jacob a verbal blessing. Y'all remember the story? Okay. Now, it is important that you understand that Jacob was under no illusions that Isaac wasn't going to find out about this. He knew he was going to find out. There was no way Isaac was going to actually bestow the headship of the clan or the majority of the wealth by confirming it with this imposter. He knew Isaac would certainly find out about it and Esau would certainly find out as well. Okay, so why in the world did Jacob still do it? The answer is that Jacob was so empty inside, so needy for his father's blessing, he was willing to just about do anything to hear his father say the words of the blessing, even under false pretenses. You are my beloved child. In you I delight and I'm well pleased. Everything I have is yours. He wanted to hear it. He wanted to hear that even though he knew it was a lie that he was working here. He just needed to hear the blessing. All right, of course... Isaac did find out about it almost immediately, and he was horrified. And Esau also found out almost immediately, and he wanted to do a murder his brother, Jacob. Okay? So Jacob had to leave. He got nothing. Hmm? Jacob never saw his mother again. He never saw his father again. His whole life blew up. All because he was so desperate for the blessing. Come on, talk to me now. Let me tell you something. All of us want to be blessed, you know. We want to hear that from somebody really important to us. A lot of us right now are farming full with life because nobody has blessed us. Oh, yeah, stay, stay with me. Why does this story resonate so much? The idea is that we so desperately want someone from outside, someone of unique and great worth to say to us, we are of unique and great worth. We need that. <laughs> a lot of the acting out with children is because nobody blessed them. And so maybe they will get that blessing from a gang leader or from somebody on the block that says, you are right, man, I like you. Huh? And we're looking for love in all the wrong places. They want the blessing. And nobody of worth in their life has been given it to them. Contrary to the counsel of our therapeutic and narcissistic culture, we actually cannot bless ourselves. If we try, 
This only creates a problem. We are social beings because God made us that way. Mm. Therefore, we cannot just bless ourselves and say, I don't care what anybody thinks. Really? We all care what somebody thinks. Huh? You're lying to yourself. We say it. We say it all the time. I don't care what anybody thinks. Really? <laughs> Viscerally, we really do not believe that when we say it. In spite of this, our culture says, you shouldn't take your self-image from what anybody else thinks. If you do, you'll be under their control. All that should matter is what you think. Really? <laughs> no, 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 no. It does not work that way. We all know it doesn't work. As a result, we are stuck in a conundrum. We're social beings. We cannot be assured of our own worth unless somebody of worth outside of us comes in and says, you are important to me. I'll be there for you. I'm committed to you. We need it. <laughs> we have to have somebody from the outside come and say that to us. But very often, no one does it and we get desperate. We then start to go around in a desperate quest to be blessed. Huh? <laughs> We look for love. Sometimes we manipulate people to get the blessing. Sometimes we are abused and exploited by people who figure out that we're hungry to be blessed. Come on now. They take advantage of us because they see that you're needy. Hmm? They see you can't get your foot in because what? Nobody has given you that validation. <laughs> you know, This is often the trouble that plagues and disturbs many lives. And that, that is the reason why on the one hand, we try to, always, to bless ourselves, just as we have been advised by the culture, which, of course, cannot be done. We try because we are afraid that if we do not bless ourselves, nobody going to bless us. So we, we act like we are blessed on the inside when we actually are not. We pretend that we have it all together so that we may get other people's approval with the hope that they will like us and maybe bless us. <laughs> we end up looking for love looking for the blessing in the wrong places. Let us make sure that we understand the problem. I want you to understand the problem. The dilemma is that no one of worth is blessing us and we cannot bless ourselves. You got the dilemma? No one of worth is blessing us and we cannot bless ourselves. So what's the solution? How are we going to, are we going to get out of this? The only solution is to get your blessing from God. <laughs> If we have the blessing of God, then we will not need the blessing of others. Are you hearing me? Huh? Then we start to bless. <laughs> we get poised. We get confidence. Huh? We will know who we are. But we will not be desperate anymore. We will not be running around begging love, begging blessing. Ooh. We get what we get from other people is like icing on the cake. Thanks, but you know, I'm not desperate. Hmm? It's gravy, it's it's nice, but it's not crucial because what? We got God's blessing. We got God. You see, when you don't know God, that's why you're behaving so ridiculous. That is the reason why the text and the benefit says, The Lord bless you and keep you. You see, with his blessing, there is hope. For his agenda cannot be thwarted. With his blessing, there is freedom. For he is able to remove any yoke of bondage. With his blessing, there is clarity. For the longings of our hearts are finally answered. With his blessing, the curse is neutralized. For his is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Are you all with me? Okay, so number one is what? The indispensable nature of God's blessing. Number two, the incarnational nature of God's blessing. And I'm looking at verses 25 and 26 where it says, The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now, what does this reference to the face or countenance of God mean? What does, what, what, when he says his face and his countenance, what is it referring to? The face or countenance of God is his relational presence. Will somebody say relational presence? 
I can't hear you. It is very important that we know the difference between the face of God and just the general presence of God. There's a difference between the two. We have all been in a restaurant at a table with a friend or loved one, haven't we? Hmm? Haven't we? Just imagine that the restaurant is filled to capacity. Everyone is eating um, in the same room, but we cannot say that they're eating together. Huh? Yeah. The tables are close. Yeah? There is a sense in which we are present to all of them, but we can see them from uh, our table, but we can't say that we are eating with them. Come on now. We can actually speak to any of them we want to. In a way, we are present to all of them, but at that moment, our face is turned only to one person. Come on now. The person we are eating, we came there to eat with. We have a conversation with that person. Let me tell you something. When the Bible talks about the face of God, it is not actually saying that the face of God is everywhere. God is actually present with everyone, but he does not have a personal relationship with everyone. He is God, so he's everywhere. But when he talks about his face and his countenance, he's talking about a relationship. For God's face to be turned upon us and to shine, which is the idea of a smile. You know, the, your face is shining when you smile. Okay? That's the idea of joy. That's the idea of radiance. Means that we actually have an intimate, personal relationship with God. Huh? Now, that is wonderful, but it is also a problem. You say, Pastor, what kind of problem that could be? Imagine for a minute that Moses must have thought when he was told by God, that at the end of the tabernacle service, every time Israel worshipped, the high priest were to say, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. That's a problem for Moses. Do you know why? Why would Moses be astounded by this? It was because when Moses went up on the mountain, Mount Sinai, at one point God turned to him and uh, he said in effect, well, at, at, at one point, he turned, Moses turned to God and said, Lord, let me see you. Let me see your glory. Show me yourself. Show me your glory. It was actually a request for intimacy. What did God say? Well, let's, let's actually read it. Exodus chapter 32 and verse 20. What he says? What did God say? You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. So you see why this is a problem now? Why can't no man see him and live? Because though God is present everywhere, because of our sin, we've lost his face. Come on now. We've lost his face. That is one of the main points of the whole Bible. Hmm? The first main point of the whole Bible is that we had the face of God in the Garden of Eden, but when we turned from him and we decided to be our own savior, our own lord, our own master, the captains of our own soul, we, did not lose, we didn't lose the general presence of God because he's everywhere. But we did lose the face of God. We did lose the love relationship, the personal intimacy. Intimacy happens when we look into the eyes. When we look into the face. When we gaze at the countenance of another. Nobody's in a serious, intimate relationship. They don't look at each other. Okay? Now, when God said, no one can look upon my face and live, what was he saying? He was saying, in effect, my absolute holiness and glory is inherently incapable of dwelling with sin. So if you're a sinner, you can't look at me and live. <laughs> they were inherently incompatible. You know, like fire and water. Fire and water, if they get together, will compete. Are you hearing me? Either the fire is going to evaporate the water... Or uh, the water is going to put out the fire. But they will not stay together. Are you all understanding what I'm saying to you? They are inherently what? Incompatible. There is absolutely no way that sin can dwell with holiness. Or holiness dwell with sin. So when more than hears God basically say, It is possible for my face to be turned upon you. To shine upon you 
And therefore, to get the blessing that comes through a personal relationship with me, he must have been sitting there and saying, how in the world is he going to pull that off? Because of my sin, if I see his face, I am a dead man. But, he, but, but, he's, but this, this, this benediction that he has given me to give to the priest in the tabernacle is to say, my face will shine upon you. Mm. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Listen to me. When Moses heard that, he must have said, yeah, that's right. If the Lord's face is shining upon us, it, it must be an act of radical sovereign grace. However, God must be doing something with the sin. What could he be doing with the sin? Because I know when you see his face in your sin, you're dead. So what is he doing? Well, we have a hint here. You know. Moses got a hint. The blessing, the benediction comes when in the service. Come on, talk to me. When does it come in the service? It comes at the end of the service, right? Mm. But, so then what comes before the blessing? Hmm? The offerings, right? The sacrifices. <laughs> the atonement. The blood sacrifices for the sin. Because of the sacrifices, there was some indication that somehow God was going to deal with the sin so that it, 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 it could eventually come back in, so that we can eventually come back into right relationship with him. So that we could see his face. So what was it? Moses did not fully understand it back then. But we understand it today. Because yeah. there's progressive revelation. Aren't you glad we moved on from Genesis? Yeah. Huh? Because in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 11, 12, and 13, he says, And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, oh, come on, I see capital M there. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down. You only sit down when your work done. Sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, somebody ought to give God some praise. <laughs> Therefore, we read in, in John chapter 1, verse 14 of our Lord Jesus, the word became what? Right. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of what? The only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It's also written in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. What? For it is God who commanded what? Light to shine out of what? Darkness. Who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Where? In the face of Jesus Christ. How is it possible? <laughs> It was not just some animal sacrifice. It was a sacrifice of the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. How did that actually bring us into a position where we can get the face of God shining upon us and therefore be blessed? The answer is actually, interestingly, embedded back in the story we started with. When Jacob and Rebecca were working to fool Isaac, before they actually did it, Jacob expressed his fear to his mother, Rebecca. Jacob said, in effect, Mom, I'm afraid. I'm afraid that I won't just lose the blessing of my father. I will actually get his curse. What if he curses me? Rebecca, in her rashness, says to her son, Upon me be your curse. What? That's what she said. Upon me be your curse. Beloved, in the most awesome reversal of all, our Lord Jesus graciously says to those of us who prove to be true believers, what Rebecca rashly said to her son, upon me be your curse. Think, think about that statement. The words Rebecca said so carelessly, never thinking that they might come true. Our Lord Jesus said them deliberately, even though he knew the full depths of what he was saying. Come on now. The curse that Jacob deserved for his trickery. The same curse which you and I earned for ourselves because of our manifold sinfulness. Was laid upon whom? Christ. So that the blessing, the benediction, the blessing that rightfully belonged to Christ might be given to us. Just think about it. 
Our Lord Jesus wore the shroud of death that we deserve so that we might lawfully be clothed in our true elder brother's garments, the spotless robes of Christ's righteousness. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, folks. The blessing comes when someone says, you are my beloved child. In you I'm well pleased. Everything I have is yours. That is now. It is now that we can... It is now that we can see how this can be done because the Lord Jesus took the curse that we deserve so that the blessing he deserved would fall upon us who truly believe. It is the countenance of Christ that is the basis of our peace. Mm. That word peace is the word shalom. Mm. The word shalom is the Hebrew word that refers to absolute and utter fulfillment of our deepest desires. What is it saying? For the Lord to bless us and keep us. He does not just wish for our blessing. He's committed to our good. For, for us to know that and for us to have his blessing is the way to get absolute fulfillment. Otherwise, we'll end up exploiting other people and be exploited by other people in a desperate quest for this blessing. Aren't you glad for the blessing of our God? Huh? <laughs> this is very, very important that we get it. His blessing is all that matters. <laughs> In John chapter 17 and verse 24, before he went to the cross, our Lord actually prayed to the Father saying, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may what? Behold my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. What does that mean? What does it mean? The gospel message is that everything that we deserve fell on Jesus so that everything he deserved will fall on us. No, you didn't hear me. You heard the gospel? The gospel is that everything we deserve, which is hell, fell on him at Calvary. So that everything he deserved, which is perfect fulfillment, would fall on us. Somebody ought to praise him for that. That's the gospel. <laughs> what did he deserve? He deserved to rule and reign. And our Lord, our Lord promised that true believers are going to do just that with him. We're going to sit with him and rule. This means that God can look at us if we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, if we, are, if we have wrapped ourselves in Jesus, if we have begged our God to accept us because of what Jesus has done, he can look on us as the blessed, as the beloved. Then the father can look at us and literally say, you are my beloved child. You, ab uh, you absolutely delight me. And everything I have is yours. That's exactly what we've always wanted. The blessing. The benediction. It is a thing that we desperately want. It is a thing that is driving us all out. Every time we get up in the morning, just way after, you know. The, you may not even know it, but this is what you're after. You want... To be blessed. You want to feel like you're okay. You want to feel like you have an identity that you have significance and that you have security. That's what you want. The problem is you get seduced regularly into seeking it from other things. But you're only going to get it with God. <laughs> only with Jesus. <laughs> it is a thing that is driving us. And it comes because Jesus says, I am going to be there for you. I am going... I'm not, not going to just wish you good. I am going to pay the price so you get it. Come on. And he did it. Oh, yes, he did it. He did it when he, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He did it when he made himself of no reputation. He did it when he took upon him the form of a servant that was made how? In the likeness of men. He did it when he, being found in fashion as a man, did what? Humbled himself. He did it when he became obedient to death, even what? The death, the death of the cross. And because he did it, because he did it, God had highly what? Exalted him and given him what? A name which is above everything. Because he did it, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, of things in earth, and things under the earth. Because he did it, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay, what have we learned? We've learned, number one, the indispensable nature of God's blessing. We have to have it. Number two, what? The incarnational nature of God's blessing. It comes with Christ alone. 
Finally, the identifying nature of God's blessing. Huh? The identifying nature of God's blessing. And I'm looking at verse 27 to make the point, which says, So they shall put my name where? Where? So they shall put my name where? On the children of Israel. And I will. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, how does the blessing of God change our lives? How does it change our lives? Does the blessing of God just mean that we feel better about ourselves and have a nicer inner feeling? Is it about feelings? No, man. It's far more serious than that. It is more than that because we are told at the very end that the blessing of God names us. The blessing of God does what? It names us. <laughs> Whenever a true disciple of Christ is baptized, he or she is baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and what? The Holy Spirit. It's the same thing as a benediction. You know? The baptism is a benediction. <laughs> when we become Christians, the way that God blesses us is not merely to shine on us, smile on us, or make us feel loved in general. Our God actually puts his name on us. Come on, man. I need you to hear this. He does what? He puts his name on us. What does that mean? By the way, every benediction is a reaffirmation of our baptism. You know, you know that? Hmm? Every time we hear a benediction, it is reconfirming what God says to us when we were immersed in the waters of believers' baptism. Hmm. What, what is so important about the name? Hmm? Imagine that there is an orphan. You know how orphan is, right? A child alone in the world. Nobody cares about this child. A child on the street. Fending for himself. Huh? Nobody claiming the child, nobody interested. Okay? Child is alone in the world, completely powerless, completely destitute. And then some great family decides to officially adopt him. Are y'all still with me? Okay. The former no orphan now has what? A name. Because, you know, you know, there are a lot of informal adoptions. Uh, and um, as long as you have a different name in the household, everybody feel like they're going to treat you like um, Cinderella <laughs> with, the, with the wicked stepsisters and stepmother. You, you understand what I'm saying? All right? Okay. So, but once you get the name, come on. And you, you hear that they wrote the will and your name in there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Things start to change. What does the name do? When he puts his name on you. What was his name? <laughs> what does what the name do? With, with, with this new name, you get a new identity. Come on, man. You walk the road before you get the name. Who that? But with the name. That's so-and-so child. Hallelujah. With this new identity, you get a gift that just keeps on giving. Come on, man. And those are best gifts. I like the gifts that keep on giving. <laughs> oh, yes. So you get the new identity. Why is it, what comes with that? With the new identity comes solidarity, accountability, security, and intimacy. Can I work this out? Look at this. You get identity. Because you're no longer anonymous. Come on, man. You know who you belong to. You have confidence. You have poise. That's a big part of it. But it's not only that. The gift keeps on well. So now you get solidarity. Come on now. The orphan is now in a family. He's no longer alone. If he has a problem, he has support. He has somebody he can call. Let me call my daddy. <laughs> when he's on the street, before he was adopted. What am I, what am I going to do? But when you're in the family now, <laughs> you not only uh, you get identity, you get solidarity. <laughs> Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody will support you. Somebody will defend you. The trouble is, you know, that man doesn't belong to me. <laughs> he has somebody who's going to be there for him or her. But I said it's a gift that does what? Keeps on, Keeps on giving because not only do you get solidarity, you get accountability. Because now that he has the family's name on him, he can't just do it like. It means that he now represents the family. 
He can't just live in your way. He has a family name. And they want him. You get the privileges, you know. But you can't run this family name in the ground. Come on now, talk to me now. So now he, he not only gets solidarity, he gets what? Accountability. But there's more because it's a gift that what? Keeps on giving. So now he gets security and intimacy because he's in the family. To have a father doesn't mean you have a boss. Fathers are not bosses. Don't, don't confuse yourself. You know, a father can be a boss too. But the father part is not a boss. Why do I say this? You see, when you're a bad daughter or a bad son, you don't get fired. Oh, Lord, have mercy. You don't get fired. You're not going anywhere. You are unconditionally a part of this family. You're not on probation. Help me out, somebody. I said you're not on probation. They might say, come on, Morris, you know. But sooner or later, they don't come look for you. Because they know you're mine. Uh, come on, talk to me. Huh? Don't, don't get confused. You'll get disciplined. Yes, you'll get straightened out. Yes, there'll be issues that have to be resolved. But you're not going anywhere. You will never be fired, for you belong. Yes. You see, you got the name. Oh, my goodness. Hallelujah. All of that is part of your blessing. It shapes you. It transforms your life. I'm a witness that it transforms it. Do I have another witness that it transforms your life? So I've got evidence. I've got confidence. I'm a conqueror. I know that I'll win. I know who I am. You see, God wrote it in his plan. And my name is victory. Hallelujah. God gave me authority to conquer the enemy. He wrote in my destiny. And my name is victory. He said that I've overcome. I know I've already won. He wrote in my destiny that my name is victory. Will somebody give the law? The power of the name. The name. The identifying nature of the blessing. In closing, it is written in Romans chapter 12 and verse 14. Bless those who what? Persecute you. Where must do? Bless and what? Do not curse. Have you ever meditated on that verse? You're a Christian. Have you meditated on that verse? Do you know what it means to bless others? I'm trying to do some application here. Huh? Let me review what the blessing means again. The blessing means that we find something great about somebody. And we not, we not only tell them that it's good. But we commit ourselves to that person to make it continue to happen. Lord have mercy. Isn't that what God does to us? Huh? Oh, yeah, 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 if, if, it's, if a child is a good student, we bless them by saying, boy, I am so proud of you. But what? You commit yourself to keep on encouraging them because you want more of the same. Come on now. Yeah. Come on now. You put yourself on the line. You sacrifice, just like the father. He's not just telling the children when he's dying, I love you and you're mine. No, 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 no. Give me some. The father must give something to, to help achieve what he's talking about. Am I right about it? Yeah. So when you bless somebody, you tell them something good mm -hmm. that you appreciate, but then you what? Commit yourself to keep on encouraging them. Right. Come on, to achieve that which you consider to be good. We become available. We let them into our space. But there will always be some among us who don't want to bless anybody. They are angry. They are bitter. They are hateful people. Who only pretend to be true believers. They all, let me tell you something. Bitter people are always focused on the past. And they remember everything that has gone wrong in your life. Come on. Because they're not wishing the best for you. Because when a father call his children around his bed when he's dying, he not wanted to talk about what happened in 1930, this or 40, this or 50, this or even last year, you know. He's doing what? He's looking ahead. Come on. He's blessing them because he's, he's looking forward. It's time for us concerning each other to look forward. Oh, somebody say amen. amen. We need to look forward. But some people, they just keep looking backward. They're looking for somebody to curse, not somebody to bless. How can anyone 
who is clearly living by the blessing of God have the audacity to refuse to bless other people. Oh, you didn't even hear that. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, please understand that our God blesses us that we may be a blessing to others. Mm -hmm. Could it be that many of our relationships are going south because we actually spend no time blessing the people in our lives? Come on, man. I guarantee you, your relationship with anybody is going to improve when you notice something good about them and you call it to their attention. Mm? And then you commit yourself to always encourage that in them. You see a relationship change because all of a sudden they say, wow, wow, this person cares about me. Huh? They bring up good things in my life and they're always there to encourage me to be better. Huh? Are you doing that to anybody? Are you doing that to anybody? Could it be that many of our relationships are going south because we don't bless anybody? Only God knows how many people on our influence are completely discouraged because we withhold the blessing. Why don't you repent today and say, I am going to be a blessing to others because God has been good to me. Anybody here can say he's been good? Anybody here can say that he's been more than good? Anybody can say that he's enough? Anybody can say he's more than enough? Or well, why don't we just bless people? But by the grace of God, everything can turn around this morning. We can all embrace the blessing of Christ this day. This will make us say like the psalmist, I will bless who now? Lord. The Lord at all times. His what? Praise, Praise shall what? Okay, you have to start with God because you're not going to bless people if you're not blessing the Lord. Psalm 34 verse 1. Only then will we be committed to blessing others if we are blessing the Lord all the time. <laughs> That's why people who don't come and praise him and bless him are so miserable. Because when you bless the Lord, you will be a blessing to others. I will explain to you about how you can actually do that in, and then I'll sit down clearly, okay? There are at least three ways that you can bless someone. Hmm? What do you look for? You look for their growth, you look for their gifts, and you look for their giving. Those are three G's, huh? Nice and easy. Huh? Growth here refers to some small ways the person is growing and making progress in their life. Any progress you see in their life, bless them for it. Bless them. Mm. But what about the gifts? Gifts here refers to talents, abilities that other people may not even appreciate, but you see it. You see they're gifted. Bless them for that. Bless them. Now what about their giving? I'm talking about the little sacrifices that they make for others that nobody else see, but you saw. Bless them for that too. See, you're blessing them for their growth. You're blessing them for their gifts. And you're blessing them for their giving. Catch them doing these things and praise them for it. Compliment them. A person who habitually praises and compliments and affirms is a person who, who is filled with inner health. You are a healthy person when you're blessing people. A person who's always finding fault and criticizing people is rotting on the inside. They're rotting on the inside. Listen, don't hate them, you know. Be sorry for them and pray for them. People who are always cursing other people, criticizing other people, finding fault. They're rotting on the inside. Let us bless one another. Bless and curse not. So when you hear the benediction, what God is saying is, I don't care how you feel right now. My face is shining on you. I don't care if everybody else in the world, including every other face you met today, is raining on you. Mine is shining on you because Christ, in Christ I delight in you. You are my beloved child and everything I have is yours. The objective blessing must be subjectively expressed. Fathers who are blessing their children do not just want to put money in their accounts. They also want to make a love connection. They want the children to sense the love of their hearts. Have you, have we been settling for crumbs from the table when our Lord wants us to have a feast? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. We can live by the blessing of our God. Receive it. Embrace it. Give it. Seek more of it. Enjoy.
enjoy it, cherish it, live it to the glory of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.